understanding, used 160 times in 156 verses of the Bible, the intelligence and insight of both God and men. If we really believe that the systems of men can deal with the evil in the world, we are on shaky ground. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is the Quick Study Radio Television Program taking you through the Bible in one year. And as we go through the Bible in one year, we are looking at the book of Isaiah. Now today we're going to be focusing on Isaiah chapter 19 through 21. This is our Bible reading assignment today and we are going to talk about national exposure. There were those in northern Israel who actually believed and even in Judah that all they needed was the right king or a man-made system to deliver them from evil. They trusted in their military, they trusted in their economy, they trusted in their justice system and it all failed. We'll talk about that coming up in a moment. Here's Corey with Bible Archaeology and History. Well, the prophet Isaiah mentions in passing that um, King Sargon of Assyria took over the city of Ashdod. So today we are going into Sargon's records to see if we can verify this history recorded in the Bible. That's very interesting. We also have Do You Know with Janice. Do you know? Yes. In Isaiah's Judgment on Babylon, do you know what the princes were instructed to do with their shields? All right, a very good question. We'll talk about all of this to put this all in context. We're in the time just after the world's first Olympic Games and just after the time, 753 BC, of the traditional foundation of Rome. So this is a really interesting time. Stay there as we continue. Isaiah chapter 20 has a reference to Sargon, the king of Assyria, sending his commander uh, to take the city of Ashdod. Well, right now, you and I are going to dig into Sargon's own records and see how accurate the Bible is. Sargon II, king of Assyria, appears in the historical accounts of the Bible, and his endeavor for power would change Israel and Judah forever. Sargon's name means the king is legitimate, which gives further evidence to the likely truth that Sargon was actually a usurper to his brother's throne. The king that Sargon took over from was Shalmaneser V, documented in the Bible and his own records as the king who besieged Samaria, the capital city of northern Israel. Something funny happens in the Assyrian records at this point. Shalmaneser's records go quiet, and Sargon's records claim the victory of the destruction of Samaria. Likely, Sargon staged a revolt and took the throne as the destruction of Samaria was coming to a close. Sargon then takes responsibility for the deportation of Israelites. According to the Bible, all of this took place during the co-regency of King Hezekiah with his father Ahaz in the southern kingdom of Judah. At this time, there was a prominent prophet of God writing a large book in the Bible, Isaiah, son of Amos. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet actually dates some of his prophecies according to the actions of the Assyrian kings. One such example comes from Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, that claims Sargon was king of Assyria and sent his chief commander to the city of Ashdod to destroy it. 
From Sargon's records discovered at his palace complexes, we learn he did, in fact, take credit for capturing Ashdod. The excavation of Ashdod also verifies this in a large destruction level at the site and the discovery of victory monuments built by Sargon and left in the conquered city. Even the detail of Sargon sending his commander into battle is verified by records that have Sargon at home during those years of battle overseeing construction. It's time to study the wise guys of the Bible. They are all around us. We are looking at our reading assignment from Isaiah 19 to 21. Now, two specific vices make a sure mixture of destruction for men and their nations, pride and rage. These tend to produce weakness among men's societies. Now, the unwise guys in Egypt and Ethiopia were proud of their national ability to fend off the steaming juggernaut of the Assyrian Empire. But God's man Isaiah is a very wise guy. He exposed himself for three years to be a living sign to the world, showing how these weakened nations would end. What can we learn from this nakedness in Isaiah 20? Let's discover. Isaiah 20. 1 through 5. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon the king of Assyria sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time the Lord spoke by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body, and take your sandals off your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and the Ethiopians as captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Then they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and Egypt, their glory. Isaiah chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. You're watching the Quick Study television program. My name is Rod Hembry, and it is great to have you along with us as we continue to study through this amazing book called Isaiah. You know, it always fascinated me how God speaks to nations. Frequently, God will speak to a prophet in the nation or will speak through some kind of national event or an even national disaster. Isn't it interesting that human history is rare with leaders in nations that actually have a connection directly to God? Well, today, Isaiah is speaking to a nation. He's speaking to the nation of Judah and northern Israel about putting their trust in their human allies, Egypt and Ethiopia. And God uses a rather unique and strange way to do that. He uses his prophet to go naked and barefoot for three years. Now, can you imagine being in the family of Isaiah and watching your father go naked and barefoot for three years prophesying? Now, the truth is, nakedness in those days meant that his outer garments were removed, but he still had a cloth covering his lower frame. Still, it was an unusual thing, and it was exposure to the sun. And exposure, of course, it not something that you would normally do in the marketplace. But there was a point to the message, that because you believe in the human answers to spiritual problems, you will be exposed to all of the elements that can harm you. And so with that in mind, we go to Isaiah chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Here is what the Bible says. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, that is a city of the Philistines, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, he fought, uh, and he fought against Ashdod, and he took it. At the same time, the Lord spoke to Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saying, I want you to go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take the sandals off your feet. 
and he did so walking naked and barefoot. And then the Lord said this, explaining why he asked his prophet to do this. Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years for a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia. Now let me interrupt the text here to say something very important before we get to the study wise point. Notice here that the sign and the wonder here was not some kind of miracle from the sky or some kind of impressive supernatural event. But the sign and the wonder here was actually exposure of the prophet Isaiah to communicate to the culture, you are exposed. The same way my prophet is. Because you have learned to trust in your own ideas and because you've learned to trust in your own human mechanisms instead of me, like I've called you to trust in me, says the Lord, you are going to see this sign and you are going to be exposed. Now that brings me to the first study wise point. We are exposed to the fallible flesh when we put our faith in our own man-made abilities to keep us from colliding with war. You see, Israel and Judah had hoped that their alliance with stronger powers, uh, they could come together and fend off this gigantic juggernaut called the Assyrian Empire that was threatening the world. So they formed this alliance, but they forgot about forming an alliance with the Lord their God. This is a tragic mistake. Beloved, may I say with all emphasis on this, that when difficult times come, when threats come and when terrorism comes, it's not for us to hold ourselves up and act proud like we can deal with it, but it's for us to get up on our knees and begin to pray and to seek God and say, Lord, help me. And that principle is true, not simply on the national scale, but that principle is true for our families. It's true for our individual people, our individual selves. When we are taken in or when we are attacked by various things, God has allowed it and now in order for us to become stronger and we become stronger and more faithful. How? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, by prayer and supplication. And I won't quote the scripture which you're familiar with in 1 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, or 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are uh, called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I'll turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. I'll hear their land. I ended up quoting it anyway. Anyway, you know the scripture. And the point is, that's what God desired of his people. Now notice here, to continue the scripture in verse 4, it says, So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and the Ethiopians as captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Not only, beloved, is there going to be failure, but there's going to be shame. And so when we put our trust in the things of men to solve us from the evil of this world and our problems individually, in our families, in our communities, and in our nations, there not only be failure, there will be shame. And so we are exposed to national shame and degradation when we decide to trust in the culture of man instead of the grace of God. We are exposed to national shame and degradation when we choose to trust in the culture of man and our own pride instead of the grace of God falling upon our knees. I simply can't emphasize that point enough. Uh, it is not nationalism or patriotism that will save a nation under attack. It is humility and a contrite heart. This is a biblical principle. And the wise guys of God's church know and understand this, and they, of course, are on their knees at the first of this month and at the fourth of this month earlier when we called people to prayer. Now, in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 5, the Bible says this, then they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and Egypt, their glory. Now, they thought that the power and the, and the proudness and the fighting ability of uh, both Egypt and Ethiopia would protect them. That wasn't the case. They were depending on man's kingdoms. We are exposed to the truth of God's power in times of judgment and divine discipline. You know, a lot of times people blame evil things that happen on the devil. But let us remember that God's megaphone oftentimes is pain in our own lives and even on a national level. 
to say to us, it is time for you to pay attention that your purpose is not simply to serve yourself, that your purpose is not simply to have comfort in your life, but there is a much bigger purpose. And may I say, beloved, I want to speak specifically to Canada and the United States. It is my opinion that the purposes of both these nations are so far bigger than anything that the culture of man chooses. The American dream is not the purpose of America. It is to change the world. The Canadian dream is not uh, to serve ourselves, but to be the healing for the nations. Now, this is my opinion. And this is what the Bible speaks when it speaks to nations that God has called out. Get into your purpose. Get up on your knees and get back into your purpose. And by doing so, coming into obedience with God and learn how to affect the world, not to impress the world, God doesn't call us to impress the world. He calls us to change the world for the better. He calls us to bring the grace of God to the world. And my question is, that goes all the way back down to our individual homes and our individual lives. Are we doing that? It's time for us to get back into our purpose. chapter 21 and there are other chapters throughout Isaiah as well talk about the fall of the city and also the empire the nation of Babylon right now you and I are going to take a look at its ultimate fall right now the fall of the neo-babylonian empire to Persia was as significant as it was dramatic this changing of world powers had happened before but perhaps never as well documented. The biblical book of Daniel, Greek historians Herodotus and Xenophon, and the records of Cyrus the Great, they all recount the events of the taking of the city of Babylon. The empire had been weakened by a chaotic succession of kings leading up to its final king, Nabonidus, who preferred to let his son Belshazzar rule in the capital. Herodotus and Xenophon both tell us that Belshazzar had been stockpiling provisions in the city of Babylon just in case this new, frighteningly motivated King Cyrus of Persia decided to try and overthrow Babylon. Around 540, Cyrus did begin his attacks. After a major loss by Babylon, they shut themselves up in their magnificent city perfectly prepared for the siege of a lifetime. The Euphrates River traveled right through the city, too deep to traverse by any enemies, and guarded well by a series of walls and bronze gates. And they had stockpiled enough food to last years. Naturally, the only thing they could do was throw a party. Daniel 5 gives us an insider's view to Belshazzar's drunken revelry that Herodotus and Xenophon both verify. Cyrus and his army had dealt with rivers before, though. They dug trenches along the Euphrates, connecting it to marshes, while their best fighters were sent down to wait by the river entrance into the city. By cover of night and drunken festival, the order was given to open the trenches. Water was diverted away, and the Euphrates became fordable. The soldiers snuck in unnoticed and took the city. Nabonidus was taken captive without a fight, but the second-ranked ruler of Babylon, Belshazzar, was killed. Remember, Quick Study Television is available on iPhones and all Android portable devices. For more information, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Mobile TV Device. Quick Study TV needs your help this summer. 
We're looking for viewers to partner with us by becoming regular giving members of the Quick Study support team. A gift in any amount on a regular basis will help us tremendously. If you as a viewer see any value in this program, would you consider giving an offering in any amount now to help us continue broadcasting every day in every way right here? Our address is P.O. Box 150, Marisol, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, it's P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also give online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. This is the Quick Study Television program. I'm Rod Hembry along with uh, two lovely ladies here. And this is, in fact, uh, a very special edition of Quick Study. The next few days is going to be, in fact, because mm -hmm. Janice, what in the world? Look look at Corey. Look how beautiful yes, Corey I is. Yes, I know. Uh, I know. I'll get her to do the Roman thing in a minute. <laughs> do, wait, do the Roman thing, Corey. There's a Roman. Uh, we were just commenting that um, not only is this an Indian sari, but if I just extend my arm a little bit, I look like What's a Roman, Roman personification. <laughs> I can't help it. The historian in me just comes out. But, but India and Pakistan have amazing histories behind their cultures as well. Now, what is this about? Well, we have very dear friends who actually began as quick study partners many, many years ago, Tom and Rubina. And since that time, they have become absolutely dear friends of ours personally and have blessed us in many ways. And just one of the many ways is that we were invited to their daughter Alicia's wedding, which by the time this airs will have already happened. And uh, Corey and I were also invited to several of the, the special ceremonies surrounding uh, the Pakistani culture. Prior with, to the wedding. Prior to the wedding. And um, Rubina and her daughter Alicia uh, loaned us these beautiful clothes, mine from Pakistan and Corey's outfit is from India. And uh, we have just been so honored to be uh, enraptured in your culture and just feel so blessed to be sitting here today in these beautiful clothing. So Corey has on a, a beautiful Indian sari. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what you have on. Yeah. And so that that's more tied into the India, the, the Indian background. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing many of those beautiful dresses when I was working with Mark Mantine as a young man, yes. Calcutta mm -hmm. Mission University. Mm -hmm. And this is from more from Pakistan. Right, for a very festive ceremony. Is there a yes. name for this dress? You know, I can't remember what it, what it's called, the traditional name. So maybe one of our Pakistani viewers would be able to help me to remember what that's called. In fact, this is really to honor. We have many yes. Pakistani viewers and we have many Indian viewers and, and we love you. We also, the program is translated in, in Pakistan. Into Urdu. Uh, on Faith TV, a great cable network by Dildar, a great friend, uh, into Urdu. And so they're going to be watching this. And so I hope we're... We just want to honor you. We just want to, to show you how much we love you and honor you. So I hope mm -hmm. you hear that. And anyway, what do you know? Well, what, uh, what did the princes do? What were they instructed to do with their shields in Isaiah's judgment on Babylon? Okay, so Isaiah has a judgment on Babylon court. Mm -hmm. You know the answer to this? I believe that I do. I think that the answer was to oil their shields because their shields were covered with leather. So I don't want to steal any of your historical... <laughs> Facts, but I think I think that's what it is based on my knowledge of um, shields and princes and the scripture. She's absolutely right because that phrase "oil the shield" actually means get prepared for war. And she's right; they were in fact made of bullhide, usually of two or more thicknesses that were stretched over a wooden frame, and sometimes it was strengthened with metallic rims and pieces of metal ornaments were also placed on those shields. And so the oiling would need to be done every now and again to keep them supple and also to keep the uh, metal rims and ornaments from rusting. It was really a style statement too. And I it mean, was a style statement. Oh, and yes, a lot it was. of times they would those shields would be covered with blood and they'd have to clean them. There'd be a lot of mm -hmm. things going on here. Mm -hmm. Very so interesting. So it was just really it was a call to war. And probably um, in that verse it says prepare the table, set a watchman in the tower, eat and drink, arise you princes, anoint the shield. So preparing the table was most likely talking about a pre like a pre-rally 
meal before the war. Yeah, and you know, it's important because when Paul talks about the moving to Roman times in the first century New Testament, he talks about the shield of faith. Mm -hmm. And this is important for us to know the tradition of the shields. The shields protected, the shields were used sometimes as aggressive weapons against the enemy, but protection primarily mm -hmm. to protect you know, you would fight with your shield in the left hand and, and your primary weapon, unless you were one of those left-handed guys, yes. like David's mighty men, you would have the other way around. Some were tall, some were small, some were round, some were more diamond shaped. And this is what Paul calls, faith he calls, is a shield. It's interesting to note that Proverbs chapter 30 also calls the word of God a shield. And so the Bible is interesting, Janice, because it's called a shield and it's also called the sword of the spirit. So it's both a shield and a sword and that is unique. It's also the only offensive weapon in the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. So the Bible is a very important weapon of war against the evil that rages inside our souls. Now in, later in the year, we're going to get into the New Testament and we'll talk more about that. Here's Call to Prayer. During Isaiah's time, the Assyrian superpower, a nation of violent consumers, was eating up every city that troubled their path. Many times in human history, nations of men have pitched their tents towards war. This is a weakness of man's nature when his power is unchecked. But God's wisdom is at work in us when we learn that signs are sent from heaven to warn us and to confront us. Every believer has the ability and the power to repent and pray. We are wise to fall on our faces and repent rather than to trust in our military arsenals when threat comes. So today we pray, Lord, teach me to trust in you alone. It is our goal also to go through the book of Proverbs. And today, as we go through the book of Proverbs, we are looking at Proverbs 17, verse 16, where it says, Why is there in the hand of a fool the purchase price of wisdom, since he has no heart for it? <laughs> it's a great question. I love Proverbs because it articulates some of the things you ask yourself. He doesn't deserve it, he doesn't want it, but why is there the, the ability to buy such wisdom? Well, the Bible says that wisdom is available to anyone who asks for it. The Bible also says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Now, the fear of God is not a terror from God, but it's an honor and a respect for God. Now, you may in your heart know there's something bigger out there. There's something that's a higher power. Let me give you a name to the higher power, Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible. Yeshua HaMashiach. And may I encourage you, beloved, to come to Christ today. You can know him. If you reach out to him in prayer and say, Jesus, I believe that you are that higher power and I need you today. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. Help me in my life. Come into my heart. If you're serious, he'll respond. Thank you for watching Quick Study today. Remember, we are supported by people just like you. If you would like to join us and become a member of the Quick Study support team, write or call today. Thank you for your generous support.